Hi everybody, this is Mr. Matthew here to give you a quick video on cell cycle basics. Uh, we'll be looking at cell cycle material through our cells lab. You'll have an opportunity to take a look, but if you wanted a little extra review, I thought I'd put together a couple of key points, a couple of key questions to help you get ready for the upcoming test. So before we get started, I think it's important to talk about how cell reproduction contrib contributes to repair and growth of a cell. And in order to do that, we need to talk about the concept of surface area to volume ratio. Now, one of the important things you have to think about is, like, why would a cell divide? And what fundamentally happens with cells is as they larger, and as the inside of the cell or the volume of the cell becomes larger, it grows larger than the amount of surface that it has. And that's in the case that it's growing symmetrically like this example here. What you'll notice is the small cell has a very high surface area to volume ratio. What that means is that it has a surface area of six and a volume of only one. As we move up from a one by one by one cube to a five by five by five cube, what we end up seeing is that the surface area to volume ratio drops dramatically. That larger cell is gonna have a much harder time getting materials in and getting wastes out. Now, if we divide that larger cell up into a whole series of little one by one by one cubes, in other words, we increase the surface area appropriately, we'll see that we can return that surface area to volume ratio, and then every single cell there is gonna have enough surface area to get materials in and out. You may recall this from the demo in class where we had a small cube and a large cube. Here, this actually has three sizes, a small, a medium, and a large. And this is meant to demonstrate how individual cells may struggle at getting materials in and waste products out if the volume is too large to its relative amount of surface area. Now the next concept we have to talk about before we get into the cell cycle is the concept of the chromosome. And what we will see here is that in the individual terminology of a chromosome, in that upper uh, right hand corner, we will see that there are two sister chromatids that make up a chromosome. We'll also see that in the lower right hand portion of that diagram in that chromosome is that we see the chromatin or DNA that's been wound up. So let's define each of these uh, terms a little bit. A chromosome is the wound up DNA surrounded around proteins and organized, and we really only see these chromosomes organized and visible during cell division or during mitosis. Most of the time, they just look like a disorganized string, or if we look down in the diagram on the bottom of the page, what you can see is the interface chromatin. It looks like this just granular material, and it doesn't have any distinct structure to it. There's none of those X-shaped materials. The other thing to know is that when we look at a chromosome, we will see that there are two sister chromatids. Now those sister chromatids are in fact identical uh, DNA. In other words, the left chromatid and the right chromatid are copies. So one of those, uh, if we take a, take a look at that, say the left chromatid has all the same information as the right chromatid. And those two chromatids are held together as a centromere. Now if we have a single chromatid, and that chromatid has all the DNA, and it's not attached to another chromatid on the centromere, it's still called a chromosome. So you may have a one chromatid chromosome, or a two chromatid chromosome, depending on when during the cell cycle or during mitosis we are looking at this. I'll bring this concept up as we work through the cell cycle and as we work through division a little bit more. But it is important to note that a single chromatid could be called a chromosome or the double chromatid may be called a chromosome. Now you should take a moment here and think about this question that's over on the left hand side. Why would a cell have two identical copies of DNA attached at a centromere. You may want to pause the video here and think about this for a few seconds. All right, so hopefully you paused it and you jotted something down or at least you thought about it and hopefully you came up with the idea that, well, if a cell is going to divide, it's going to need to have two identical copies so that each of the daughter cells will end up getting equal amounts of information. So you don't want to divide and split up the library. You want to make sure that every daughter cell is going to have the identical information. And that's why at some times during the cell cycle we're going to see two chromatid chromosomes and at other times we're only going to see one because the cell is not really ready for division. Um, maybe it's just come out of division 
and so therefore it only has one copy of DNA. So now let's take a look at the overall cell cycle. And here's what we see is the cell cycle. And you'll see that there are different phases. Looking at the outside circle, what we'll see is there's the M phase and the I phase. The M stands for mitosis and the I stands for interphase. Now it's important to note that mitosis is only the parts of division and the cell cycle is the combination of both M phase and uh, interphase. Interphase is divided into three different parts, G1 phase, S phase, and G2 phase. And so there's a lot of things on this diagram to help you out. Uh, one of the things to note is how small M phase is compared to I phase. What that means is that cells actually spend very, very little time dividing in their life cycle. What they spend the bulk of their time doing is they have the bulk of their time growing, being metabolically active and then preparing for division. They spend very little of their life cycle actually in mitosis or in cell division. And if you take a look at, say, onion root tips and count up the number of cells that are in the various uh, stages, you'll see that most of them are actually in interphase, um, the vast majority, large, large percentage of them. The other thing you'll notice is that within interphase, we have the G1, the S, and the G2, and these are represented different times during the growth and metabolic activity. You'll also see that G0 phase, uh, which is when some cells actually opt out of the uh, cell cycle entirely. So if you think of a cell that becomes an adult cell and then never divides after that, say an adult neuron, after that cell has formed, it may never divide again. It may jump out of the cell cycle into G sub naught. So that's a little bit more complicated in terms of the general life cycles of cells, but it is a part of it. G1 we say is a growth phase. This is after mitosis, the cell grows. The S phase, S stands for synthesis, and synthesis is the time in which the DNA is going to be duplicated uh, and other metabolic processes will happening, but really the most important thing in terms of cell cycle leading into mitosis is a uh, DNA replication to double the amount of DNA. And then in G2 phase is the, all of the rest of the portions of the cell, it's the last growth phase in preparation for M phase, and M phase is mitosis, which is actually the cell division. So I would like you to pause and think at this point, at what point during the cell cycle are chromosomes made up of one chromatid and when are, the two chrom uh, when are they two chromatid chromosomes? So why don't you pause and think right now. All right, hopefully you're back. And hopefully what you came up with was that during G1 phase, we only have one copy of the DNA. And so that would be a single chromatid chromosome. And then during S phase, actually during the time where we double. So the beginning of the S phase would be one, but by the time we're done with S phase, we would have two chromatid chromosomes. G2 would be two chromatid chromosomes. And then in M, what we end up doing is we end up having the two chromatids pull apart and the cells go from two chromatid to one chromatid chromosomes. All right. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that during G1, during S and G2, they actually wouldn't look like those X-shaped chromosomes. It would just be unwound chromatid, but the relative amount of DNA uh, would be there in each of those relative phases. We're only going to see those chromosomes in chromosome form in that X shape that we saw earlier during M phase. All right, so let's go through M phase and talk about the events of mitosis. So as we just spoke, the cell will be in interphase before it gets into mitosis. And mitosis will start with prophase. Prophase is going to be the time in which the cell membrane breaks down. The chromosomes are actually going to form, so that chromatin is going to wind up and twist and form the chromosomes. We're also going to, in this animal cell, see spindle fibers form by the centromeres. And uh, we're basically going to be getting all of the parts necessary in order to pull the genetic material apart. During metaphase, what we see is that the chromosomes line up in a single row uh, through the middle of the cells in this sort of metaphase plate is the term that we use, where all the chromosomes are going to line up in the middle. And what you'll end up finding is that the centromeres are going to at be attached to spindle fibers at this point um, during metaphase. Then we'll move into anaphase, and in anaphase what we see is that the uh, sister chromatids are pulled apart so that we end up getting each of the uh, future daughter cells or each of the poles that will turn into future daughter cells 
will get one copy of the genetic information from those original chromosomes. And then during telophase, this finishes pulling apart. We will also see the for formation of new nuclei, new nuclei around those, and then we will also see the unwinding of those chromosomes back down into chromatin in these phases. We will then see what is known as cytokinesis, which is the splitting up the cytoplasm, and this is also where the organelles will be divided up so that each of the daughter cells ends up with their own organelles. Now, another pause and think for you um, will come out when we look at the differences between plant and animal cells. So, first thing to note is that when we look at plant versus animal cells, it's important to know that Plant cells don't have centrioles. Um, they do have some spindle fibers, but their formation is a little different, and they don't have the centrioles as part of their cells. We should also know that they have to have a cell plate, because unlike animal cells, they have a cell wall, and that cell wall has to be built as well. The cell wall is going to separate those two cells. So at the end of cytokinesis, we're going to have this cell plate forming the cell wall that separates those two cells. In animal cells, we are going to see that there are centrioles that produce the spindle fibers, and also the cell membrane is going to pinch at a furrow to end cytokinesis, and so when the cell membrane is pinched off, that's actually when we're going to form the division of the two cells. Now the question I think is, what organelles in plant and animal cells divide on their own, so that they must have multiple copies during cytokinesis. So pause and think back to what we talked about uh, earlier in the cells unit and think, what organelles might need to divide on their own? All right, hopefully you're back now, and now that you're back, you have thought about the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. And that's actually part of the evidence that goes into our endosymbiotic theory, is that uh, both chloroplasts and mitochondria have very prokaryotic uh, forms of division. It looks a lot like binary fission, and binary fission is something that we see in bacterial cells, uh, not in animal or plant cells. And they have to divide on their own and have enough um, organized so that when the cytoplasm splits, each of the daughter cells will end up getting enough copies of each of those organelles um, in the animal cell, just the mitochondria. And in plant cells, both mitochondria and chloroplasts. All right, I hope that was a helpful, quick review of learning objectives associated with cell division. Uh, and obviously, ask questions to your teacher if you need any extra support.